years ago, this week, Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO President Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accords. I watched sworn enemies shaking hands on the White House lawn, and I was sure that peace was just around the corner. Back then, it was a lot simpler for a young American Jew to call herself a Zionist. Back then, it felt like Jews everywhere agreed that a two-state solution was viable. But by the time I arrived in Israel for rabbinical school, just 20 months later, that optimism was already unraveling. I will never forget the November night when I heard that Rabin was assassinated at a peace rally. Adding to the shock, his murderer was a fellow Israeli, a religious zealot, some called a hero. We poured onto the streets of Jerusalem, joining dazed and distraught Israelis who held signs that read, Busha, shame. For the first time, I understood that one of the greatest threats to Israel's survival was the extremism within our own people. Over the next 30 years, Oslo died, Israel's left-wing parties disintegrated, peace with Palestinians fell off the agenda. The stain of occupation continues into its sixth decade, and this year, Israel elected the most right-wing, ultra-religious government in its history which quickly moved to weaken the independence of the judiciary, steamroll the rights of minorities, and mobilize a private militia. In a matter of months, this new government has taken actions that threaten to turn Israel into an authoritarian, theocratic state that very few American Jews will be able to support. What a distance we have traveled in so little time. Of the eight billion people in the world, Jews make up only two-tenths of a percent, just 15 million souls. Approximately seven million of us live in Israel, and another seven million live here in America, and there are only a million Jews everywhere else in the world. As in the time of the Second Temple period, which had two major Jewish centers, Israel and Babylon, the Jewish landscape of today also has two centers of Israel and America. But increasingly, these two Jewish communities do not understand each other. Most American Jews see our Judaism as inextricably linked with our ethical values of democracy, egalitarianism, pluralism. American Jews no discrimination and bigotry. And as little more than 2% of America's population, we are particularly sensitive to minority rights. When we hear Israel's government write off Reform Judaism as inauthentic, when ministers declare that a Palestinian village deserves to be wiped out, or proudly affirm their homophobia in the name of Judaism, we recall the core charge we were raised with at our Seder tables to be attuned to the outsider because we are that outsider. For most secular Israelis, however, their Judaism is deeply connected to their nationalism, inextricable from the very land they live on, serve, and protect. When attempts to implement Oslo led to Arab violence and the Second Intifada, Israelis paid the price with their lives. When Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, instead of calm, there was Hamas rule and rocket fire. Israelis couldn't comprehend how American Jews kept insisting on more withdrawal from territories as pathways to peace. They saw us as naive, or worse, unconcerned for their security or safety. Our two biggest Jewish communities literally speak different languages. We understand Judaism differently, and the current moment is testing us like never before 
The distance feels so great, we no longer remember what connects us. Does anything still bind Am Yisrael as one? This question might be best answered by a story from the Talmud. A rabbi was walking down the street and noticed a man with two heads and one body, what we call conjoined twins. Upon seeing this incredible sight, the rabbi wonders, does that man have to wrap two to fill in boxes or is one sufficient? <laughs> because, well, that's what rabbis wonder about. <laughs> the answer to his question comes from a midrash of King Solomon who also encounters conjoined twins when they come to argue for a double portion of inheritance. <clears throat> Solomon has to decide, are they one person who happens to have two heads or two people who have to share one body? King Solomon devises a test. Pour hot water on one of the heads and if the other head screams out, well, then you know they are indeed one soul. Yes, this is a very cruel test. <clears throat> Remember, this is the same King Solomon who suggested cutting a baby in half to ascertain its true mother. But there is something quite profound in this teaching. If we want to test whether or not the Jewish people are still one body, we must see how one head responds to the suffering of the other. This is not a theoretical question right now. The Jews of Israel are crying out in pain. I saw this with my own eyes as I marched with hundreds of thousands of protesters in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem who've come onto the streets week after week for over eight months who rally against this government while waving Israeli flags, singing Hatikvah, because they protest in the name of their patriotism and their Zionism. I watched interviews with senior Israeli Air Force reservists who warned of a grave threat to Israel's security as thousands of Air Force and Army reservists refused to show up for duty as the first judicial reforms passed. Central heard directly the anguished voice of Rome Ohayon, the CEO of Iggy, Israel's largest LGBTQ youth organization, who shared that her community is losing hope that they have a future in Israel. They're not alone. A recent Israeli poll reported that one in four Israelis is considering leaving the country. Even if an exodus of this scale is unlikely, the numbers themselves are a cry for help. Mati Friedman, Yossi Klein Halevi, and Daniel Gordis, Israeli journalists who often interpret and defend Israel's actions for a mainstream Zionist audience, wrote an unprecedented open letter in the Times of Israel pleading for American Jews to get involved before it's too late, saying, the change is afoot will have dire consequences for the solidarity of Israel's society and it will do grave damage to our relations with you. This is a moment for alarm. It's worth saying that there is also real pain on the other side of these protests. Mizrahi Jews who've been treated like second-class citizens ever since they arrived, younger voters who came of age in the shadow of the Second Intifada, uprooted settlers from Gaza who never saw the payoff promised to them for leaving their homes. Their pain showed up at the voting booth, and this government has mobilized a coalition of the aggrieved, which threatens to tear Israeli society apart with a force that even the government can no longer control. The other half of the Jewish world is in some very hot water. How will we respond? Micha Goodman, an Israeli public intellectual who spoke at Central last year, put this current moment in historical perspective when he related the curse of the eighth decade. You see, only two other times in Jewish history have we Jews had sovereignty over ourselves 
the first Jewish state established by King David 3,000 years ago, and the Hasmonean dynasty of the Second Temple period. In both instances, internal strife in the eighth decade, Jew against Jew, precipitated our downfall and destruction. Now we seized a third opportunity for self-determination when the state of Israel was founded in 1948. But do the math. We are in the eighth decade. You don't have to be superstitious to believe that the curse of the eighth decade could strike again. And if Israel were to no longer exist, how would you feel? I want you for a moment to imagine it. A world without a Jewish homeland. Really, see how that sits in your heart and your soul. It should feel unthinkable and compel us to act. But I also know there are some of you, sadly, who don't feel compelled. To you, I urge, if you care about democratic rights, help preserve the only functional democracy in the Middle East. If you care about the vulnerable, safeguard the sole sanctuary for Jewish refugees in need everywhere. If you value Jewish peoplehood, hear the cries of the other half of our Jewish family and remember the destiny of Am Yisrael is bound one to the other. This young, messy, miraculous Jewish state is the most important sovereign democratic project of the Jewish people of the last 2,000 years. We cannot walk away. While the task can at times feel overwhelming and exhausting, Pirkei Avot teaches it's not our duty to complete it, only not to abandon it. We stand on the eve of another new year, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh means head. And Shana comes from the root to change. So this Rosh Hashanah, I'm asking this head, the American Jewish community, to change our approach to Israel in three ways. The first is to really listen to Israelis. Don't just get your news from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Listen and read Israeli journalists. Put the Times of Israel podcast on your list. Come here the speakers we will bring to Central. And, I know this is hard, but try to listen in order to understand, not to offer solutions. Yes, this is exactly what I tell my husband when I talk to him. <laughs> Often, empathy is what we really need most. As Mati Friedman recently said on the Identity Crisis podcast, it sounds sentimental, but Israelis need to hear that you're with us. But things feel a little lonely over here sometimes. This December, Central is bringing our first congregational trip to Israel since the pandemic began. And in February, we are bringing our board of trustees because it is critical that the leadership of one of the largest American synagogues be in relationship with the people of Israel and hear them. Secondly, reformed Jews should give our su support and money. Because here's the truth, most American Jews have been under supporting our values in Israel. If you want to see change, fortify the protesters, support the Israeli reform movement, fund the NGOs and institutions that are building a more just, democratic, egalitarian, pluralistic Israel. This is not about trying to remake Israel in our American image. This is about helping Israel live up to its own foundational aspiration as stated in the Declaration of Independence as, quote, a country for the benefit of all its inhabitants, based on the precepts of liberty, justice, 
and peace envisaged by the Hebrew prophets. That is an Israel worth fighting for and funding. Finally, od lo avda tikvatenu, we must not give up hope. Giving in to despair or remaining silent, these are acts of complicity in a time of moral urgency. And if you need a shot of optimism, look no further than these protests, which have stirred to action an estimated seven million Israelis since January. From Likud to the left, from kippahs to the non-kosher, only 11% of Israelis voted for the ultra-nationalist and ultra-religious parties that have hijacked the current government. The vast majority of Israelis want reforms, but also refuse to be governed by extremists, and they have not given up. Once again in the streets of Israel, the central chant of protest echoing years past calls busha, shame. Busha for undermining the checks and balances of democracy. Busha for turning a blind eye to Jewish violence in Arab villages. Busha for denying basic civil and human rights in the name of Judaism. Right now, both American Jewish and Israeli heads are crying out, busha, shame. And that's good, because shame is a sign of moral clarity. We feel shame when we recognize that we are not living up to our ideals. Rabbi Sharon Cohn Anisfeld, the president of Hebrew College, reminded me of the holiness of the Hebrew language when she recently taught that if you take the Hebrew root letters of busha, bet, vav, shin, and reverse them, they spell shuv, return. It might be that our shared shame in this moment is exactly what enables us to return to each other, and to our shared values. Shuv, that is our call for this new year. Now, the last time Israel succumbed to the curse of the eighth decade, we made our final stand atop the desert stronghold of Masada, those first century Jews who took their own lives thought that this was the very end. And for 2,000 years, it was. But recently, Israeli scientists took ancient date seeds found in Masada's storerooms and miraculously germinated them, these fragments of the past, into blossoming date palm trees. Long ago, the psalmist had a vision, Tzadik Katamari Frach, that in our promised land, the righteous would flourish like date palms. We have not realized that promise yet, but I've met so many who nevertheless persist. As you all leave services tonight, we are giving you a jar of date honey made by building together an inspiring cooperative of Israeli and Palestinian date farmers. As we dip our apples into this honey for the new year, may it connect us to the many righteous who are fighting for a more just, democratic, peaceful Israel every day. May it remind us that even a 2,000-year-old seed can bear new fruit. May its sweetness call us to return. Odlo avda tikvatenu. We have not given up hope that we are still one body, one beating heart, one Am Yisrael. Al-Hamar Behamatok 
al viteinu hatinoket shmor eli hatov al haesh hamevo eret al hamayim hazakim al haish hashav habayta min hamerchakim al kol Things which join as one. 